All right. Well, hey, hey, <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome to Nothing Else Is On. My name's Gabe. I'm Tim. And I'm Andrew. And we are excited to be on with you tonight because Nothing Else Is On. Or at least we thought Nothing Else Was On. Interestingly enough, we discovered that Nothing Else Was On on Monday nights, and then something has literally been on almost every Monday night, including tonight, the night before the election. And so today is kind of like a Nothing Else Is On special edition. And so um, special edition election version. And I figured why not start with some presidents of our nation's past to guide us with some thoughtful quotes. And I want to see. But before we do that. Oh, before we do that, we before that, people we what should we're tell doing. people. Why well, are we here? Well, it's a special. It's a special. You'll have to forgive our host, Gabe. He's never done this before. <laughs> This is literally my first time. And so I'm so happy to be here with you. We are actually, this whole thing, nothing else is on, is a time to talk through broader realities as it's through the lens of the book of Revelation. And man, it's been quite a bit of a conversation over these past couple of weeks. So if you have questions, there's a number there on the bottom there that you can text in those questions. And we will, if you text them in, address some of them. So please do <laughs> text in your questions. We want to engage with you. But first, let's engage with some dead presidents. Now, um, I've got a couple quotes, Andrew and Tim. I want you to tell me what president you think said this thoughtful quote. Just any president. Any president. We can go all the way There's back. No to, era. No, 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 no. It's just any president. So just okay. you got you got yeah, it. No, you got, got it. it. I right. have a lot of confidence in you guys. You're historical it. aficionados. Okay, so here we go. My esteem and this country has gone up substantially. It is very nice now that when people wave at me, they use all their fingers. Ooh. <laughs> Who said that? I don't know. Come on. That feels like, I'm gonna go TR, Teddy Roosevelt. It's, Ooh, nice. Uh, it feels like John Quincy Adams to me, I think. <laughs> I got a good feeling. <laughs> Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter said that. Oh, totally. Man, living the dream. Sunday Born school again, teacher. Man. Sunday school teacher. That nope. sounds like a Sunday school teacher. <laughs> <laughs> I actually think I've had a Sunday school teacher say that. <laughs> he learned it from Jimmy. Now, number two. Being president is like running a cemetery. You've got a lot of people under you, and nobody's listening. <laughs> Who said that? That Which sounds president? like every president ever. <laughs> Which president? Uh, Give it a guess. Clinton. What say you? Ronald Reagan. Great guess, but Andrew pulling it out of his hat. Way what? to go, man. All right, way to go. And now my phone's about Do to I die. Do I get to leave? Or <laughs> is that the price? <laughs> All right. All right. Two more quotes. Two more quotes. Nothing was ever done so systematically as nothing is being done now. <laughs> I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna go Calvin Coolidge. Calvin Ooh, Coolidge. good guess. Good that's, guess. That's what he ran on, I thought. It is. <laughs> um, oh gosh, Wilson, Woodrow Wilson. No, actually I started scrolling down and now an ad came up, so <laughs> don't show me this. <laughs> we brought Wait you here for to it. do one thing, Gabe, and this you. was it. <laughs> Woodrow Wilson, Woodrow Wilson. Wait, was Woodrow Wilson? This is, this that is was me. your guess? Yeah. yeah. All right, you, whatever. You okay. Over there? No, I'm not. So that's two for Andrew. Two for Andrew. Does that I'm, mean I get to go home? <laughs> Does that mean I get to Okay, there is one more that was my absolute favorite. Hold on, hold on. I got to find it because it's just too good. It's too stinking good. Okay, wait for it. Wait for it. <laughs> oh everybody's, everybody's like so frustrated at what's happening right now. Oh, no, they, they turned it off. All <laughs> right. If I were two faced, would I be wearing this one? <laughs> I'm gonna go Grover Cleveland. On that. Oh yeah, <laughs> good guess. Yeah, uh, I don't know. FDR. Abraham Lincoln. Mm. Can you believe it? Abraham I actually, Lincoln. I actually can. That, <laughs> that makes sense. Actually. Man, presidents in our history. They were pretty shrewd and, and thoughtful dudes. All right, so here I want to end actually with this quote, and then we'll transition from Theodore Roosevelt. And I think it's an important quote for our time, for our day. He says, do what you can with what you have where you are. And with that important phrase, and I think really good words of wisdom, Andrew, I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah, so I was thinking today about what should we talk about. And so I actually just want to throw out a question as questions come in. Mm. Um, and it's actually something I've thought a lot about, but I don't think I actually have great answers to. 
Uh, and it's it's like really tricky because it's a it's a counterfactual. So it's like we're just kind of guessing. But so much, right? Like, or actually, the entire New Testament is written into a monarchy. It's mm -hmm. written into a dictatorship, essentially. Right. And so whenever the New Testament is talking about public engagement, political engagement, it's within that framework. Mm. Uh, what would change? Or what do you think would be emphasized more is maybe, or, and less is maybe a better way of putting it, if the New Testament were written into like a liberal democracy, like mm. what we have in the United States today. So we, we have a vote, we choose representatives, uh, the majority gets a say uh, in policy and all that kind of stuff. So if it's written into that context, what changes in the New Testament or what would be emphasized more, mm. you think? Well, I think one that would be, um, if you're moving from a dictatorship where you basically have submission, revolution, or die, um, and maybe all of those involve death, I don't know, but, um, and now moving to democracy where you do have an option to actually change policy, change broader structures, um, I do think uh, the biblical authors would have leaned a little bit more into advocacy and the role of the church to care for the po poor and policies I mean, that was one of the big things that the Apostle Paul was charged with when he's proclaiming the gospel and thinking about the inclusion of the Gentiles. Is like, they told me, don't forget to care for the poor. And even when you go to the book of Philemon, this, or this little letter, what is the Apostle Paul doing? He's leveraging his privilege that he does have, his position, his right. authority, right. to actually advocate for a runaway slave to come back, experience rec reconciliation, mm. and to be received as a brother. So he's doing that with the power he has in that context. I can only imagine... At least I would guess that in a democracy, what, he would yeah. think through what what does it look like for Christians to lever the, leverage their voice towards kingdom values and policy making. Yeah, yeah, okay. Same Advocacy. Point. Yeah, I, I don't know what you think first. Well, I had a couple thoughts. Um, I, the first one is just because it's kind of on my mind, hmm. even in light of tomorrow, is I think we would get more language around the role of conscience within the Christian community. Hmm. And so that's a category Paul talks about, right, in particular in letters like um, 1 Corinthians and Romans, right, where right. there's division in the church around, I guess what you would call secondary issues. Mm -hmm. um, Meat sacrifice to idols. Right, so the, yeah. that's, the, you know, and there's a lot of debate about how to under, even understand some of those texts. But uh, the big idea there was, there can be legitimate disagreement within mm. the Christian community around this practice. Mm. And there are certain circumstances maybe where you shouldn't do it, but there are other circumstances where it's like, hey, it's kind of up to you and who's around you. And, mm. and so here you have Paul explicitly there, not really picking sides on that issue, but saying love is the ethic. Like mm -hmm. the, the goal is that the Christian community should not be divided over this question. Mm. Um, and I don't think all of politics actually falls into that category, but I think some of it does. Um, right. And would we, I, I wonder, would we get more language in the New Testament around political conscience issues? Mm. Like, hey, how to solve this problem, how to speak into this issue, we may actually disagree. Mm -hmm. And that's okay, that should not pull apart the body of Christ. Um, yeah, and that's fascinating because I think even there's been, and I think you and I heard the same talk at one point. There was a scholar that was highlighting. That doesn't sound right. <laughs> there was a scholar that was saying that conscience, even Paul's work there around conscience, is what set the framework for our current democracy. Like this sort of this category, category of, of conscience was a bit entrepreneurial in terms of the broader landscape of the first century and how to, how to navigate disagreement. Um, and that particular framework has really set the set the foundation for what we experience, even in terms for the of idea that we can be in community yes. and work together for a common goal, but not yes. agree on everything. Yes, yeah. yeah. That actually, the Apostle Paul, led by the Holy Spirit, was a huge catalyst. Huh. I don't know if I've heard that before. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Yeah. So that'd All right. be, you don't want to come on, that. Tim. Come on. No, I think actually I would take a different. Actually, let's move on. Well, okay. <laughs> so let's. Do you have any questions? Question, coming I got a couple uh, more. No, I got no, a couple no, more no, quotes from dead presidents. Uh, <laughs> Can we no, go back to that? <laughs> I think so. In most of the the scriptures, it's really it is sort of submit. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of the primary theme. Although there's some interesting even readings around. Is there some irony in the midst of that command? Totally. But I think there'd be. And there are clearly yeah. subversive. 
images yes. and texts, even in Revelation. Right. Yeah. Which we've talked about. So I actually think I think there'd be many more warnings about compromise than mm. than what we get because it ultimately the 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 lines were so stark. Right. It's mm. it's Domitian in the church. It's Nero in the church. It's like just the lines were. This is an this is an enemy. Right. This is an enemy to the church. Mm. I think in our context, those lines are are much fuzzier. Yeah. And oftentimes there are people who might even advocate for things that we would advocate for, um, but are are not necessarily good. Um, right. And so I think there's a tension that introdu- that begins to introduce itself um, into the Christian community now, which is okay if I'm to be engaged in politics, mm-hmm. um, whether the right or the left, one I cannot critique or criticize the party apparatus. Right. Because if you do, you have no future in politics, right? right. And, that's, and that's, a, that's a bipartisan thing. If you, mm-hmm. if you criticize either of the top of the party, mm-hmm. you're, you're out. Like, mm-hmm. you're not getting a job. You're not going to have influence. Um, and I've talked to, to people who are running, and that's the tension they, they live into. Mm-hmm. So compromise becomes even more of a, a potential issue where a party is going to run afoul of something that's central to Christian witness or that's central to the kingdom of God. And, yeah. and how, do you, how do you navigate that? Um, so that, that the compromise piece is one. I think there'd be more on that, and also I think there'd be more warnings about uh, about political power in particular mm. and its 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 potential abuse. Right. So again, mm-hmm. Christians mm-hmm. did have political power, so there's no there's no warnings. Yeah. But then when you get to the Old Testament, where there there are kings mm-hmm. who are always looking for That's political alliances, yeah. you know, whether it's uh, you know Hezekiah and Assyria, whether it's mm-hmm. You know, at the end of his life, he welcomes the Babylonians mm. into the temple and shows them everything, and that's his undoing. S- the seeking of political allies and power is almost always universally condemned in the Hebrew That's a good story. However, yeah. that's, that's a theocracy. It's different. They were to trust God, so it's, it is a different right. context. It's, yeah, it's not one-to-one. Um, but yeah. but I, I think that uh, um, warnings against compromise as well as... A, a thorough critique of political power. I think we, t- and I think you're getting that actually in Revelation. But mm-hmm. I think those themes would come out stronger um, because of the fact that we actually can access that power um, now. And what I'm not saying, I want to be clear, is I'm not saying that that means we shouldn't go advocate for oh, for sure. issues of justice. You know, caring for the poor or uh, caring for the unborn. Like those things are, are central to Christian mm-hmm. witness. Um, mm-hmm. And yet, uh, when we access those levers of power, hmm. those aren't neutral things. Those sure. are, the, you know, absolute power corrupts absolutely. It's, it's, those things can begin to influence us. Um, mm-hmm. And I think the, the scriptures would say more um, to that. That's really good. A good tension around probably a greater charge towards advocacy, but also a greater warning on where that can take you down a dark path, right? So maybe a good tension mm-hmm. that would be more explicitly named in the New Testament. Excellent. One quick note. Someone just texted a really good thought, uh, which is that they pointed out that neither Jimmy Carter nor Bill Clinton are dead. <laughs> well, they're dead to me. Oh, <laughs> no, 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 no. The good point. Good is, point. is that is that right? Are they alive? Well, I know Bill Clinton's still alive. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, move, I mean, moving given on. between the choice between someone I don't even know who they are and Gabe, I'm gonna go with someone. I, don't know. <laughs> I, I think they're right. That's they're right. Yeah. <laughs> on a neutral field, I'm going with Actually, the stranger. What's even crazier is that Abraham Lincoln's still alive. <laughs> <laughs> In my heart. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, we, well, I was going to add to that thought, but I'm not sure how to do it well, but I never know how to do it well. Uh, it's around compromise. I wonder too, and this is less to do with if the first century church lived in a liberal democracy, but it's more if they were writing to our political moment today in the mm. West in particular, uh, the cultural West. Mm, mm, mm. There's a lot of conversation right now, and I know you guys have been looped in around the three movements of like Christendom. So mm-hmm. movement one is right. the New Testament era where Christianity confronts paganism. It confronts right. the old world religions and it wins. Mm-hmm. Phase two is kind of the increasing influence of Christianity uh, over the, the, the global scene. And mm-hmm. it is a glo- now a global movement in mm-hmm. a way that mm-hmm. I don't, I mean, I think Paul maybe imagined, but I think he'd still be blown away by mm-hmm. uh, how global that, that, what that meant. He's, but a lot of people are talking now about a post-Christian world mm-hmm. where, and, and you don't see this in the places like China and Iran, parts of Africa, 
where they didn't have that first face, right? They weren't highly influenced by Christianity and they're mm. experiencing it now for the first time in their worldview. Mm. But in the West, we now have politicians who have a political vision that is very much shaped by Jesus teaching, mm. even mm. if it can't be articulated, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's it, and we've heard some, you know, like a Mark Sayers call it a Christianity, the, a kingdom without the king. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so now even in our political moment, what I've found is we've now got to be careful because our own language and vision as Christians is often shaping mm -hmm. policy and politics with zero reference to the metaphysical aspect of the kingdom we believe in. Mm. Like, oh, no, but we believe in a king. Um, and I don't know if I'm describing that very well, but I, I think it's another moment where it's easy to compromise because the language now is so similar. Um, Why do you think that's so dangerous? Like you're, you're saying, okay, w we've got this kingdom without a king and this ideology where now people are buying into ideas but not anchored in a person. Like what do you think are some of the big dangers there? Kind of going back to your initial question that some of the initial biblical authors, they would have even tapped into that. Is that an appropriate way to ask that? I, well, maybe another way of saying it is I think we are more tempted now certainly than in the New Testament era to look to politics to solve our ultimate problems. I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because they've bought into a powerful kingdom vision mm -hmm. that is utopian. Mm -hmm. Like Jesus' vision is utopian. It's, and it echoes I'm, of our I'm, heartstrings, right? I'm going to yeah. fix the world. Yeah. <laughs> but we know as Christians that actually, we, we, can't, we can't do that. That mm -hmm. only happens when Jesus returns. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we have, we're in a moment where that we we want to say everything but that last part. Mm. And that's actually really confusing and maybe even tempting, I think, for the Christian community to, to buy into. It's like we're overconfident of what's possible, which sets us up for deep despair and also under-concerned about the distortions of power. And it has a tendency, yes, and a tendency to put so much hope in the political process that it actually tears us apart. Hmm. Because Ergo the church. we're saying, you're, by disagreeing with me, you don't want heaven to come to earth. Mm. When that should not be our posture. We know heaven doesn't come to earth until mm. Revelation, mm -hmm. uh, the end of the book of Revelation. So I don't mm. know if I'm saying that very well. But. Yeah, well, I think even that speaks to something uh, Maria Odell put in the comments. Mm. That every election we think our lives are going to rise or fall yes. with the outcome. And listen, if, if everybody listened right. to Maria more oh often we'd all be in better we'd all be in better shape <clears throat> but no it's, it's an apocalyptic election you, even Maria. even a uh, like go odell <laughs> like watching political ads like they're borderline creepy it's like hey i'm don't worry i'm gonna take care of your kids <laughs> like hey man just could you not like just leave my kids alone all right like just go vote some things whatever but that apocalyptic code <laughs> is like i'm gonna usher in and and even i think as we as we process our own votes often mm. we're thinking about what kind of world yeah. we're, our, our, will our kids inherit so that, mm -hmm. that's why they speak to those things but it is it's not just a, a political kingdom. It's apocalyptic um, in the wrong, like that's not what the biblical sense of the word is, but it's, it's apocalyptic in the sense of it is, everything's, right. on, everything's on the line. Mm -hmm. um, and it's tomorrow. a deeply, if you watch political ads, hmm. and I was listening in on my wife's policy, uh, she's at UMKC in grad school right now, I was listening in to one of her professors, who's a, a policy specialist. Mm -hmm. And he talked about this new phenomenon. It's called, I think he called it moral politics. Because what he, no, narrative, narrative politics. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that the conversation politically is not about policies. Hmm. It's about defining the story. Mm -hmm. Who's the good guy? Who's the bad guy? And how do we mm -hmm. get rid of the bad guy? Hmm. Um, and he said, watch political ads. Yeah. And they are not generally framed around, here's what I think. Yeah. is going to help people. Hmm. They're framed around, here's why this person, we have to show them in like red and black and the voice changes and it's all <laughs> yeah. meant to communicate, this is Sauron, this is Satan, this is bad yeah. and we mm -hmm. need to beat them. Mm -hmm. And it's like this little mini story, just pa a narrative mm -hmm. packaged into this. There's mm -hmm. nothing necessarily to do with, oh, here's what we think is best for the common good. Like that phrase is mm. just dead like you'll mm. never hear that right like what do we think is best and you think that's best and i disagree with you like that conversation just doesn't exist anymore mm. so do you I think, think apocalyptic is a great word it is a it is apocalyptic do you think and maybe this is a not a good question but 
I mean, I'm, I've always been familiar with like bumper stickers, like with various politicians' names on it. But I feel like there's like been how do you get that sticky stuff off? Like how do you do? <laughs> no, but <laughs> like, peanut like butter? there's been a movement from the stickers to the flags of the candidates with the names. Is that kind of even part of it too? Like this allegiance kind of component? I don't know. Okay, I don't know. Whatever. I'm just throwing it out there. Yeah, I don't know. But I do think it's measurable. I think it's measurable the rhetorical changes that have happened mm. in Western politics over the last 50 years. Mm. Like you can, you can look yeah. at it and say, this is how we talked about things here, and here's how we talk about it now. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure that there are PhDs being written right now as we speak as to why that is. But I think at least part of it, in, in my thinking, is that it is the apocalyptic nature mm. that, that, hey, we can, with the right vote, we can solve our, we can solve all the world's problems. Mm. And, and we, as, I think as Christians, should know that that is just not true. That will not happen. Mm. We should be much more, I think we call it a hopeful realism at Christ Community. We mm -hmm. should be more realistic in our hope than I think many people are, who are putting religious categories and impulse behind, behind their politics. Hmm. It's, a, it's a spiritual fervor that Could, will not succeed. It won't satisfy. Do we have any more questions coming in before yeah, I say something else? There's a really good one here. about. Uh, we've, so we've learned a lot about the symbolism in Revelation. Mm -hmm. Is there an intentional symbolism to the stark con contrast between the jacket that Andrew is wearing and the jacket that Gabe is wearing? <laughs> Could there be two pieces of clothing more opposite? I'll be honest. I did look at Gabe's coat, and I saw it was Patagonia, and I was like, that's legit. But that pattern, mm. I don't know. Am I at a lodge? <laughs> am I at my grandma's house? All it does is it screams, you're going to have an amazing hug. <laughs> I just, it, do, it does. That's a huggable jacket. It feels, it feels great to wear, and when you get hugged by me, you're like, oh. That was phenomenal. Yeah, it's like, is that's it, my is goal. It Christmas? Is it? It's what's going every on? Season that you love. <laughs> I just want to thank you so much for these amazing <laughs> questions. You guys are you're restoring my faith in humanity. Keep them right coming. Now. Keep them coming. It's all. I can tell you about my shoes. It's all on the table tonight. They're 100 percent recyclable. If you're curious. <laughs> all right, uh, a real question. Uh, um, that was a real question. If uh, if the response to this election is chaotic, what should the mm. church's response be? And let me just say, like, I think I'll we'll just put some things on the table. Uh, Ooh, I think things. both both candidates have sort of basically said, "Well, if I lose, that's a sign this thing's rigged." I mean, both both have said that. Yeah. Uh, so, what are we gonna do if it uh, if it gets weird? That's, I thought you were gonna have a good answer, not just restate. The no, question. that's my job is to answer, <laughs> is to ask the question. Hmm. 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 Actually, I'd like to put a pin in that. Can we come back to that more towards the end? Fine. Okay. Is there another <laughs> good, good question? question? It is good. I actually would love to end there a little bit more as we kind of move on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so why then, and we, we started getting into this. Why does this election feel so polarizing? Ooh. Yes, 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 yes. I think, okay, here's one part of it. Now, 2016 was extremely polarizing, to be sure. I actually think this feels more, more polarizing. And I'm going to say the thing that most of us are thinking in some degree or another is that, I mean, COVID has isolated us. And when you are not sitting across the table from someone having a real conversation where you get to watch their facial expressions, where you have to be accountable to how they respond, you can't just send a message and then walk away. You've dropped a, a truth bomb. You've named your truth. You've spoken it. Um, and you, now you feel great about your, no, you have to like deal with the person. When we don't have to do that, whether you choose the medium of Facebook, whether you choose text, whether mm -hmm. you choose yeah. email, there's a lot of those different avenues that we can do this. But when, we, when we're living in a moment of hyper distance, of social distance, and then now living in technological realities, it's so much easier to get amped and to not feel the consequences for just bringing down havoc on your quote unquote opponent. And that, it's hard to not feel the consequences for losing your temper. That deforms us. Yeah. And rather when we're in person, you can see someone get broken over what you're saying. And you're like, ooh, I shouldn't have said that. Next time I won't. Now we just have over and over and over again, saying what we want, when we want, without the same sense of repercussion. Mm -hmm. And we get a ton of likes. We get affirmation that what we said with the intensity we said it is exactly what should have been said 
So we not only don't have the repercussions of a lack of self-control, but we have affirmation that that's exactly how we should respond in the world. Right, and they've, I've heard people talk about how social media platforms um, and I want to say not just social media. I'm talking about like just other avenues too. But my too. point is about social media. Okay. Um, and I actually don't mean to. I like social media. Mm -hmm. um, I know Tim doesn't, but I kind of do. Uh, <laughs> but I don't. one of the unique, right, it's, I think it's this unintended consequence of the basic logic of social media, hmm. which is that polarizing statements get responded to even if they're not liked they get yes. responded yes. to more yes and the com little computer says oh people this catches more eye. so you actually end up elevating mm -hmm. especially on like a twitter type platform mm -hmm. the most polarizing statements hmm. and then you add on top of that that these are not faces they're they're pixels mm -hmm. And then the, that begins to stand for them. Mm -hmm. It's like this statement stands for them when that's probably not true. Right. Um, that creates this recipe of polarization. I also I was reading an article recently about um, how they've done sociological study on, I guess, what you call it, like radicalization. Hmm. Like how does someone, how do people get radicalized, um, quote unquote. And... They've, we, we can now demonstrate that if you enter a conversation or a space, whether it's online or even in person, hmm. of like-minded people hmm. on a particular issue, you will generally leave even stronger in that position than when you came in. Like-minded people. Yes. Okay. So when you're around people who feel really strongly about a particular issue with which you agree, mm -hmm. And you enter into community or conversation with them over a length of time. Hmm. It will generally make you stronger in your commitment, hmm. um, and potentially even demonize people who disagree with you more. Like it, hmm. it has a tendency. So that's just kind of normal human behavior. But if you add the internet and then COVID to that, mm -hmm. and you have a lot of me too, like oh, right. like oh, I'm with you. I feel the same way. Oh, yeah. I'm seeing. And then all of a sudden, I think that's at yeah. least part of it. Yeah, well, and I'm gonna so I'm gonna defend the polarization in a second. Ooh, Go, Tim, oh my God. yes. The, but for, first, the, the takes. It's like no. But the first, and the zag. But first, one thing I do want to say is, you know, there's someone, and I wish I could remember the exact phrase that just called uh, referred to social media um, and Christian presence on social media as uh, the acceleration of bearing false witness against your neighbor. And you you mentioned how how often would they say that on social media? <laughs> It was a podcast. <laughs> Does that count? Mm. I don't know. Uh, but so anyway, he, uh, I mean, his point was, how often do we say, and you, you, you alluded to this, how often do we say something in a way that actually the person who holds that, of, that view would agree? Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, that's that should, we should, as Christians should, should care about that. Yeah. Because when I say, you know, Gabe believes in wearing weird sweaters, Gabe's like, no, man, I, I believe in you know, huggable sweaters, whatever, whatever that thing is. <laughs> and it's like, how can I, rep I, am I actually representing Gabe in a way that he would recognize? And I think mm. social media just amplifies the fact that I don't have to do that. Who cares? I'm, just, I'm gonna represent yeah. it in the, the demon voice the on the ad, right? Effect. Yeah, yeah and gonna... that, which to those Christians, like that is, that is, one, of the, that is one of the commandments not to do. It's bearing yeah. false witness against your neighbor. But to even, I think, to, to go back maybe to, to think positively around the polarization and that hopefully will lead to less of it, which is we ultimately are advocating for what we, we see as good. Hmm. I mean, hopefully, right? Now, there's obvious exceptions to that where people are advocating for evil things, but, but we're, we, we want some kind of vision of justice, some kind of vision of peace, or some kind of vision of you know, the, the government working in a particular way. And if we can attach those to Christian values vision, that's a, like... That's yeah. why I think we can feel so much like this really matters. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I think we can all think of issues on the table right now in election that we know God cares very deeply about. I think where, where Christians should have then a, a fence or a guardrail against that is one, we remember yeah. our fight is not against, against flesh and blood. Right. Where our first calling is to preach the gospel and welcome people into the kingdom of God, especially our political opponents. Um, two, we don't bear false witness against them. So we're trying to, we're actually trying to understand where they're coming from. So we, we want to learn, we want to listen, we want to grow. Um, and then third, we, heaven is not coming with this vote. Whoever I'm voting for and whatever convictions I'm speaking out of, heaven will not break in, mm -hmm. um, depending on who wins the election. So Christians, I think, can advocate and should advocate very passionately 
but with those guardrails of I'm not crossing into right. the demonization, the bearing false witness, the attacking um, yeah. other people in ways that um, are personal or um, are not God honoring. Mm -hmm. um, so that you know, to defend the polar, I think ultimately people are like, hey, I. I I have a vision of the good, mm -hmm. and I want that. Well, and even to your point about like proclaiming the gospel, like what what I don't hear you saying is the gospel is just a me and Jesus yeah. proclamation. It definitely has a personal component that Jesus died for my sins, but it's a Colossians one reconciling all things and these angelic beings, these principalities and powers that have massive influence on the broader structures and systems of the world. Right? That's it's much more of a macro perspective on the movements of our world. And that is where you find Christians led by the gospel seeking this reconciliation of all things, justice and these different passions and components connecting to these different issues. So yeah, that's a really good observation, Tim. Some great questions here. I wanna, I wanna throw this one out. Um, what are some indicators that we have fallen prey mm. to political idolatry? That sweater. <laughs> <laughs> this is a sign of political uprightness. So, oh my goodness. You can wear that sweater and know who you're political voting for. <laughs> <laughs> All I can tell you is I feel good. I feel good. Um, I actually have been really helped by the book um, Compassion and Conviction by the Anne Campaign. Yeah, yeah. And I think what to this question, they really helped me was, and even if it was something you said earlier, Tim, you know, you know you've fallen into some idolatries where you've been so indoctrinated by a political partnership that you're unwilling to even question those you've partnered with. Mm -hmm. um, to think that there's no way that any of parts of my party are wrong or misguided. Rather than looking to scripture for the ultimate guide, it's just where your party is as your ultimate guide. Mm -hmm. And you can look on both sides. And we could go down that road and we could say, well, on the left, there's been a movement. This is where it was really helpful. In the Democratic Party, there's been a movement of abortion as a necessary evil now to abortion as a, a good. Like there's been a movement. On the right, there was immigration is tricky to now immigrants, the demonization of immigration. You know, so there's like on both sides, there's both sides of these parties where you're like, I don't think as a Christian, I can agree with you 100% on either of those issues. And so when we do say my party has it 100% right, we've fallen into some idolatry because there is some deep brokenness there. And what is promoted on the broader party line? Wasn't that fun? That yeah, no, I thought good. that was really thoughtful. Um, I probably would add, and I, I know that every story is different, mm -hmm. and there's only so much of actually of what I'm about to say that we can control, mm. but I, I think what really breaks my heart is when I see families or communities breaking apart due to political difference. Yes. And that to me is a sign of, of an idol. Mm. Um, when this when this is so important that I don't love people anymore, mm -hmm. um, because even we're supposed to love our enemies. I mean, mm. that's just such a basic Christian yeah. idea. Um, and Jesus is somehow able to love both, you know, Levi, a tax collector, and Simon the Zealot, who had completely different political visions. Yes. Um, Mm -hmm. but both could live in community together and be discipled together. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's another sign of political idolatry. Mm -hmm. I think when you, when you get to a place where you can't say anything good about someone who's on the other side of the aisle yeah. to mm -hmm. you, um, mm -hmm. and obviously there's critiques to be had, like I'm not saying we all yeah. just sure. we get around the hug sure. and, and, and all that, but... With the sweater. <laughs> with that sweater. But this moat, like... <laughs> I don't know if you like in debates where it's like, hey, say something good about your opponent. And it's like, you know, I hate them less than I used to. It's like yeah. they can't do that. And it shows hmm. this hard heartedness hmm. um, towards one another. And I think Christians, because of the Imago Dei, like we believe every human being is made in the image of God, should be able to look at any other person. This is why I even it said, like, I think ultimately the polarization is people on the opposite side of the political aisle are fighting for what they see as, as, as good. And it may be misaligned or maybe misdirected in my own in my own understanding of things. And yet, as a Christian, like I'm called to enter into that space mm. and see how like the vision they have that's in front of them may be misdirected, but somewhere in there is a God planted desire for mm. for something good. And if you can't name that, I mean, if you think about whoever you're voting for tomorrow. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> if you can't name anything good about the other person, 
I think that that's a sign that you fall into idolatry because that's, mm. that's an Im image-bearing human being who you may have political differences with, but ultimately uh, is a person loved by God. So. Well, and maybe one other thing to add in there, what's so fascinating in the, in the epistles, right, is that we find even in, with atrocious dictators, some of these emperors, yeah. even there are, there are subversive ways to kind of go about that that the New Testament writers do go about in terms of resistance or pushing against some of these broader structures of, of injustice and actually seeing how the gospel and the kingdom speaks into it. But then simultaneously, the same thing that's coming out of their mouth is pray for the emperor. Yeah, pray for the king. Pray for the... So if, and this is where I think this would be a good sign is if you're a Democrat and the Republican wins and you can't pray for that leader and pray for their good and pray that God would that's actually... That's a bad sign. That's a bad sign. If you're a Republican and the Democrat Party leader wins and you can't pray for them, that good would come to them and that so come to our... That's a good sign you've fallen into idolatry that's actually contrary to what we see on the pages of Scripture. Yeah. Because no one is as bad as those emperors. <laughs> well, and even a quick example of that, uh, one of the most famous Christian writings, the first apology of Justin Martin, Martyr, mm -hmm. was written mm. to the Roman emperor... Um, mm, good, I good. shouldn't try to say this name. Antoninus Pius. Uh, you shouldn't have. I shouldn't have, but I, I tried. Wait a um, name. I think so. <laughs> uh, and he would, so Christians were being persecuted, but yeah. Justin Martyr writes to the Roman emperor saying, mm. I want you to become a Christian, and here's why. Mm. And here's my philosophical. He also says, stop killing us, but he's like, here's <laughs> my philosophical defense, and I'm yeah. writing this to convert mm. you. I'm mm. just, and you say, can you pray for your leaders? Mm. You know, whoever you're voting for tomorrow, would you say... I hope you embrace the gospel of Jesus. That's mm. my deepest hope for you. And mm. to say that not with like, because you're such a loser, you know, yeah. but to say that because I love you and I care mm. for you. Mm. And maybe thinking of the time here, I wonder if we go back to that question. I know, right? We've just been having so much fun. There will be warm hugs <laughs> oh after gosh. all of this. Not on camera. But I think, let's go back to that initial question that we said we wanted to put a pin in. Would you ask it afresh for us, Tim? You don't remember what it was? I don't. <laughs> I knew it was good. It, it was if the election uh, is chaotic, the response to the election is chaotic, what should the church's response be? Great, great. Well, I do think an important thing, and this kind of goes back to something I said earlier, is no matter what the circumstances of the world, we have always been, as Christians, people of prayer. Because even when things feel utterly uncontrollable and out of our control, we know that the Lamb is on the throne. And so one of the first responses, and I know it's kind of churchy and super pastorally, but it's still really important, is pray. Pray that God would bring order. Pray that God would protect his people. Pray that God would actually bring about a peace. And not a shallow peace that consistently pursues oppression, but like a genuine peace that actually seeks the good of those who live in this land. And so I think one of the first steps when we feel like things are chaotic is to first turn to prayer. I also think just even just, and I, I think this is both a Christian call and just a leadership principle in general. So mm -hmm. if the Christian community is going to lead through chaos, if there's a chaotic mm -hmm. moment yeah. where yeah. we can step in and have influence, that always starts with being a non-anxious presence. Very good. Like Very leader, good. Leaders don't lead mm -hmm. from anxiety mm -hmm. and fear. They lead from... Are you sure about that? Yeah, well... <laughs> um, I feel like I have some counterexamples. <laughs> well, what I mean is good leaders. Good leaders yeah, yeah, lead yeah. from a non-anxious presence. Even when there's disagreement, mm. um, they lead from a non-anxious presence. And so I think prayer is a part of that. Mm. It's, it's mm. a posture of, let's show the world that this is not an existential fear for the mm. Christian community, mm. even if it is for them. Um, mm. And depending on your worldview, it might be an existential fear, right? That's, yeah. This is all there is. If this breaks, what do I have? We mm. can say, well, there's more. Mm. Are you interested in that? <laughs> um, and so how that works itself out practically, I think, can look a lot of different ways. I think prayer is, is an essential part of that. Mm. Mm. But however, even just with our neighbors, just being a non-anxious presence mm. if thing, in, in chaos. Even online, online being a non. I mean, imagine that, mm. being a non-anxious mm. presence online. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think that would be a, actually a really important discipline mm. if this next week got really chaotic. Mm. Mm. Well, and hopefully Revelation's been helpful on that yeah, front. I, is yeah, I hope so. While, while certainly there's a lot of anxiety inducing in, in what we're seeing in the world around us, in Revelation, the church was, was truly in, in, in jeopardy. I mean, persecution, you know, Christians were there's probably only 10,000 Christians or so given uh, in the entire world at that, at that moment. Right. It's a persecuted minority. And yet Revelation enters in to say, don't look at the world around you as 
a, a line from my sermon on Sunday, a quote uh, from a pastor named Harold Sinkbell, who says, you, you've, got to play, you've got to pay closer attention to invisible things. Mm-hmm. And our eyes are often so focused on what's in front of us, and what Revelation does is you've Peels got to pay more attention to invisible things. Things and when you do, it doesn't mean hmm. it's all there's all you know sunshines and rainbows. It's it is it is there's actually real evil in the world, hmm. and yet you get the the way Christ conquers that in so many different visions from hmm. the Lamb, um, you know, opening the seals to Jesus on Mount Zion in Revelation 14 to the, the rider on the white horse in Revelation 19 to finally the, the pictures of the new heavens, new earth. Hmm. So, some of our own response should be to become that non anxious presence, to be meditating in the scriptures and have our vision and imagination for what we see around us yes. shaped by what scripture would have it um, shaped by. And maybe, you know, as we wrap things up here, one of the, I think, one of the really important things for us as God's people and as the church and for, you know, Christ community folks who are watching is, man, amidst prayer and keeping our eyes on invisible things and this non anxious presence. Another big, big component to this is stay. Stay in your church. Like when you feel frustrated because there is another congregant or a brother or sister in Christ who's maybe a little more excited because their candidate won or a little more dejected because their candidate lost, stay in the church. Because we are going to need, like when the world goes, if it goes chaotic, we're going to need each other now. More than ever. More than ever. And that doesn't mean we need you perfect. That means we need you messed up. Like, if you're broken up over this, you need to be in church and your church needs you. Um, If you've been overly hopeful and uh, maybe your candidate won and you're just maybe a little too arrogant about it, like, you need your church and you're probably going to need some folks to say, hey, calm down a little bit, buddy. (laughs) Like, we need each other because the walk with Christ was never a solo venture. It was something we're meant to do together. Cross the New Testament. The only letters that were written to individuals were those that were pastors or going like specific individuals within church communities. And so we are going to need each other. So stay in your church. And if you've been on the fringes, now's the time to lean in all the more. So that, that's what I think would yeah, be kind well of the component. Yep. So thanks so much for joining us tonight. Um, I'm sure you could be watching a lot of other things, <laughs> but we had the conviction that nothing else was on. And so we're really grateful you chose to spend your night with us. Have an amazing, amazing week. We're praying for you. We love you a whole lot. And seriously, this week and any week, we're here for you. So don't hesitate to reach out. Take care.